what are the general elements you, you look for when you're identifying a cult? Well, for me, there are like four major elements. Um, first is the authoritarian leader, sometimes considered charismatic, but it's someone who is usually a narcissist and who demands all loyalty, all attention, total obedience. Um, and that person usually has come up with the belief system. And so the second element is what I call the transcendent belief system. It's that it's a belief system that gives you the answer to everything, right? To the past, the present, and the future, and offers you some kind of salvation. Um, but the key, the key point in the in this belief system is that the philosophy is the end justifies the means, which means you can be asked to do anything. And as long as it's for the goals uh, of the group or the leader, then it's okay. And once you have that kind of philosophy, it means anything goes. And that's where often the trouble comes in. Mm -hmm. And so third and fourth for me are what I call coercive systems of influence and systems of control. So the control mechanisms are those things that are quite obvious, you know, the rules and regulations that that may have to do with what you wear, what you can eat, who you can marry, how many kids you have, whatever, but it's the obvious stuff. The less obvious stuff are the coercive influence techniques, um, which are basically plain old social psychological influences um, things that prey on your emotions, right? So they manipulate guilt and fear and shame and love and all of those things to get, again, to get you to comply and to get you to go along with what's, you know, what they're demanding of you. And so that's where the indoctrination comes in. Um, so those are the four things I look for. And in most cases, there is always some type of exploitation, whether that's sexual, physical, or financial. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I mean, you talked about having like a um, like a like transcendent belief system. One thing that like as like millions of people have heard about profundity now, and a, like like this, a lot of the comments are like, how could anybody believe this? Because you know she's the story she's telling is that she's like a space alien, um, and that she said the world was going to end on the equinox. It didn't happen. Like she, a lot of like just stuff that's kind of out there, like. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think people understand that, like, it doesn't start that way. It's not what you right. sort of get introduced to. So, right. so can you explain, like, why, like, um, like, I guess this, this, like, suspension of belief or something, like, um, right. well, it, you know, it, uh, joining one of these groups and um, becoming a quote a true believer, it, it, it's really a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, typically, you're invited to something, you're um, what we call loved bomb, you go to this first thing and everybody makes you feel very special. And so then you feel obligated to come back the next time. And then you're slowly introduced to perhaps the leader and some of the beliefs. And so it's little by little by little. And by the time you're, you're, you know, one on the outside would think, why aren't you catching on to this? By that time, it's too late because you've been indoctrinated too much. You're enmeshed in this community that feels like a new family to you that you've made commitments to. Most people don't like to renege on their commitments. So they think, okay, I said I was going to do this. I guess I'll do it. You know, and you just keep slowly going along until you're fully indoctrinated. And so what seems completely cuckoo to us on the outside, to those people, that is their world, that is their reality. What what have you seen? Um, I mean, this isn't the first time like um, a cult leader has predicted the end of the world and it didn't happen, like, or just made, you know, some like this is some prediction that, that doesn't come to fruition. Like, how can you, uh, what have you seen in, in groups like that in the past? Failed prophecies are very common, and the way we understand those is through the concept of cognitive dissonance. And this uh, this concept or this theory was developed by um, a social psychologist named Leon Festinger, 
And in the 50s, he, he and some of his grad students infiltrated a, a UFO cult in New Mexico. And there again, the female leader said, OK, tonight the spaceship's going to come and get us. And of course, the spaceship didn't come. And so Festinger and his students thought, oh, boy, this is it. You know, everybody's going to leave, right? The spaceship didn't come. But no, in fact, people became more and more devoted and more and more dedicated. And so what Festinger developed was this idea of cognitive dissonance, where when reality bumps up against your belief system, right, it's so difficult for you to accept the reality because you have to basically give up everything. You have to give up your belief system. You have to give up your identity at that point, right? So in fact, what it does is push people in deeper because they can't face the consequences of, of just, you know, losing everything that they ever believed in. And mm -hmm. so it just, again, it's kind of a peer pressure thing. You know, one person goes along, the next person goes along. Other people see, well, no one else is saying this is hogwash. So I guess I should, you know, go along with the crowd. Mm -hmm. Something, so this is kind of a weird question, but I've been playing with advanced AI, like, well, like I'm exposing this, this group, you know, using it for transcription services, using it. I made a video today uh, with advanced AI where, you know, I had Jim Jones saying what uh, Linda was saying, like using her voice. Wow. And I, I see this now as like, you know, this is a tool that is going to change our lives radically, like the advanced AI. And you could use it to influence it. Like, I, you know, you can make like a false reality. And I wonder, like, have you, th have you thought about this? Have you thought about like how a, a cult leader could, could use like technology? You know, I just the other day, someone I'm good friends with talked to me a lot about AI because of a book he's reading. And I haven't really thought about it or what it means until then. Um, most cults that are smart, obviously, will keep up with the times and will keep up with technology and will adapt as needed and will use technology to their advantage, just as they did with the internet. You know, mm -hmm. in the last four years, since the sheltered in year, you know, we've seen this plethora of internet based cults and people getting recruited in that way, which was very, very rare before that. So I don't know exactly what AI does, but from what you describe, of course, that's something that cult leaders will use to continue to exploit, to continue to, you know, make up their crazy theories and, and get people or, to or follow back them. them up. Like, um, like we're talking about like internet cults. Like I think about like QAnon and like all these exactly. crazy, you know, outlandish, you know, Hillary Clinton's drinking baby brains or, or whatever. Like if you, <laughs> if you could put that on video, if you could have a video of Hillary Clinton, like sucking a, a baby brain out for adrenochrome or whatever they believe. Like that would, you know, be, uh, it would get even like crazier and everybody be guessing like what is real and people would just like reinforce people's exactly. uh, beliefs. Right. They can provide so-called validation for what they're saying. Yes. What do you think about the the pandemic and how cults ex kind of exploded? Like in this, like profundity yours, you know, it, it was a really small deal, you know, it was uh, based out of a trailer park and then the pandemic came a bunch of people were searching for answers. They found Linda and it just kind of like exploded. Now they have this like expensive compound. Like how, how have you seen that? Like these, these, these how, like how cults use the internet and, and with, with the pandemic where, you know, we were all online with, right. time, you know, a lot of us weren't like working at our jobs. Um, and right. people, people were looking for big answers. Right. Exactly. On the internet. Right. I mean, cults will always take advantage of whatever social crisis is going on, right? That's why, you know, there are some cults when there's an earthquake or tornadoes or whatever, you know, they'll rush to those places and supposedly they're helping, but they're really doing it to recruit, right? Because again, you've got vulnerable people. And so that's exactly what happened during the pandemic. And especially during, I guess it was 2020, the year we were sheltered in, you know, people were upset. They didn't know what it meant. Some people were absolutely isolated in their homes. Um, and even if they were with other people, everyone was spending so much time on the internet because that was really the only connection to the outside world. I mean, nobody was going outside, you know, I mean, yeah. rarely, 
or seeing their family or seeing friends. And so people got lost, you know, they, as we say, they fell down these rabbit holes. And, and so that has had a huge impact um, on, on cults. I mean, that, that was the year in 2019, I thought I was retiring. I left my job at the university, retired. I moved to back to the Bay area and I started writing my memoir and then boom, all of a sudden, you know, I was getting, you know, 50 emails a day of people asking for help or journalists wanting to talk to me or somebody in the family whose uncle, you know, went over the edge. And so, you know, it absolutely went wild. Unlike, you know, before that, we had just a few cases of so-called internet-based cults. Um, but but now, it, and the difficulty is, you know, with with what I now call the the run of the mill brick and mortar cults, right? When you when you know where a cult is and you know where they're situated and you know where their headquarters is, you know who the leader is, you know where their centers are. It's much easier to to do your research and and analyze and look at them. But when you've got these internet cults, you know half the time you don't even know who the leader is, or you you know they put up some fake. Yeah, picture, it, it, it's you know? sort of it, it's weird in that like QAnon doesn't really have the charismatic leader. Like maybe it's this guy, maybe it's Trump. It's all these people right. who, like parrot it. But I, I, one thing that's really interesting to me about this situation is I think like if you look at like who are who's most vulnerable to join a cult, it's really like idealists. Yes, um, exactly. And, and then. You, you you had like it went beyond that to like people everybody's searching for like alternative answers they don't like the answers that they're being given so they'll accept it seems like they're willing to accept answers that you know sort of you know are, are go into dangerous territory and you right, know can be, reality you yeah. can be indoctrinated by a, a cult right right I mean, when 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 people are vulnerable, that's when cults can recruit successfully. And of course, we're all vulnerable at many points in our lives. You know, if we just got divorced or we just moved, whatever, whatever. But during that time, you know, it was very easy to get people to look at these other options because they, they didn't know what was out there. They didn't know what was happening. And so it's very, very ripe territory for for cult recruiters absolutely why do you think it's important to expose cults like these operations like what is uh what, what do you think about i guess i i'm doing this all you know on the internet i've been doing it for like two and a half years i really kind of have there's really two cult stories that i've i've really dug into and gotten information out there and it's kind of changed the way these cults operate like do you, what do you think about like this this journey of exposing cults. Well, I think it's really important. Um, I mean, there are right now there are so many cults and so many different types of cults that there's always going to be a cult that will appeal to you, right? I mean, that the thing about about the the cults and recruitment is that the message they have has to appeal to you. It has to be something that you would connect with, right? So for me, for for example, I was in a political cult, right? I was fighting to, quote, change the world. I never would have joined a meditation cult because I can't sit still that long, right? But yeah. someone who came along and said, hey, help us, you know, get rid of sexism and racism and bring about social equality. Well, that sounded terrific. So now that there's so many different types of cults, there's always going to be one that's going to find you and connect with you and lure you into their midst. Um, and so it's, um, you know, it's it's absolutely a new phenomenon that we're dealing with. Can you, like, what do you think about the, I mean, that's an issue too. Like you were in a cult that was like a left-wing cult. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of cults are, um, you know, they're all authoritarian, but you see like, you see a lot of like right-wing cults. Yes. Like, what do you think mm -hmm. people should know about, you know, how this can really go anywhere? Well, I think that's the issue. And in terms of you saying, you know, the importance of exposing these groups is a, a lot of groups on the surface may look very nice, you know, very like very good people. And of course, everyone is looking for that meaning and purpose in life and that sense of community, right? That's just a normal human trait. Um, and so by exposing these these groups that are actually very harmful, I think that's important to do. I think the more that the general public can learn about how these groups operate, what they do, what they believe, 
how they actually exploit people and harm people, I, I think that's very, very important. I mean, we can't just sit back and, and let it all happen because there's too much harm. There's too much abuse happening. A lot of people really have no idea how prevalent this phenomenon is. Like, you know, a new documentary comes up and they're like, oh, there's a cult in, there's a cult in 2023. Who knew? <laughs> um, and I guess like before I learned about this stuff, I used to think, yeah, this is something some crazy people follow this guy uh, once every five years or something. It happens. And right. like, and you, but it's so prevalent. And I, I wonder, like, I really want to ask you, I think that there should be some like in high school, when I went to high school, we had uh, everybody got together, all the students, and there would be some lecture about drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, should there be a lecture about like abusive relationships and cults in high school? Yes, there should. I mean, that's one of my pet peeves is that it's very difficult to get into the schools, either elementary or high schools, because they're so afraid you're going to talk about religion and you're going to offend someone's religion when cults actually have nothing to do with religion. Yes, some cults may say they're religious because, first of all, it's so easy in our country to become a religion that many cults that aren't remotely religious will file for that paperwork so that they can hide behind the First Amendment. But that's the difficulty of getting into the schools. And I mean, I can talk for days without mentioning religion. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same in the courts. A lot of times the courts don't want to take these cases because they think it has to do with religion. Um, so that's that's been the problem of having any kind of, you know, national education program about this. I wanted to ask you about this. So th this this seems to be America is kind of the land of cults. <laughs> like There's cults everywhere. But like, I think be a lot of these groups take advantage of um the absolute religious freedom that we have in this country, which is kind of like, you know, there's no protections for it. And I, th I think people would, would be pissed off too, if they realized that like right. a ton of these groups are not paying taxes. Right. No, oh, right. And some of them are super wealthy, mm -hmm. super wealthy. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think what you raise about there being so many cults here in the United States, I think part of it has to do with some of the aspects of our social culture. I mean, I think in America, people like to look for the quick fix, right? So they run into someone who says, hey, I can bring you this. I can, I, you know, you can make millions of dollars by sticking with me, or you can have the perfect spiritual faith. I mean, it's it's this quick fix mentality. And also the, the kind of, um, since the new age movement of the 70s, this sort of rejection of Western medicine and Western science. And so that stuff is considered all bad. And so people go with these alternative belief systems or these other spiritual systems that they really know nothing about and don't know nothing about the traditions of those systems like the guru system. And so then again, they just get swept up in this sort of fervor of so many people doing this. You know, it's it's almost like a I don't know, I don't want to call it a mob mentality, but it becomes a trend. So in, in Profundity Yours, there's a ton of similarities to Heaven's Gates, just like if, from like the theology, the, you know, there's UFOs, they're going to join the Galactic Federation. And in the, 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 the there's this huge mixing of religions, which is the thing mm -hmm. that I like sticks out most. Like Heaven's Gate had this on their website, on their, uh, they they sort of did this primitive SEO where they put in like, Jesus and Buddha and like all these religious things in the background mixing like anybody who was searching for religion and like trying to find that can you explain like why that's like would be beneficial to like a cult leader yeah sure I mean cults want to connect themselves to legitimate traditions and so glomming on to some of these um respectable religious leaders or like say the Dalai Lama, right? If you remember the Nexium case, the cult in New York where they had the women who were branded, right? I mean, they orchestrated um, and ended up paying a million dollars to the Dalai Lama to have him come and, you know, put a scarf around Keith Raniere, right? Um, so it made me question the motivations of the Dalai Lama, but also it's such a typical thing that cults want to do. They want to align themselves with legitimate characters. So 
you know, Jim Jones would have pictures of himself taken, like with the mayor of San Francisco and things like that. I mean, that's that that's all of that is to their benefit because it gives them legitimacy. One thing that you brought up, like talking about Nexium and branding, I think pe some people have the idea that like Keith Raniere is in jail because these women got branded. Um, but that's not true. There was there. That's actually not a crime because nobody said no. And I find this in a lot of cult stories where something real fucked up happens, but the the person like didn't say no. So there's not a crime. It's, cults get away with things just all the time based on this system where you know you can you can you can do anything to somebody, and if they agree to it, like in Heaven's Gate, people were getting castrated. Like you couldn't. Uh, you couldn't say that that was a crime that Doe Applewhite or Marshall Applewhite committed a crime because the people agreed to it. They consented. Um, right. I see that like with extortion too, where people, if you know, the IRS calls them and said, "Did you give them this money?" and they're like, "Yeah, I did. They're great. They're you know, Jesus. Right. No crime." Like, like, what do you think about that? Well, that's that's one of my big issues right now is getting the concept of coercion understood by law enforcement and by the legal system, because I I run into this all the time, right? I'll have a husband who calls me and says, you know, my wife has given a half a million dollars to this energy worker in another state, and she doesn't make a move without checking with him. And she's giving our children these weird potions that he's recommending. And he goes to the police and they say, well, you know, she's 40 years old. She, You know, if she wants to give him money, that's fine. It, no, it's not fine. They don't understand that people are coerced. They're they're negatively influenced by these leaders, and and so it it's not with consent. I mean, if they were of their quote of their right mind, they wouldn't be doing it. And it's because they've been indoctrinated and pushed to believe in these leaders that they have the quote the answer. Um, but it's not it, they're not doing it by their own free will. Their free will has been altered by the will of the leader. And so that's what it's so difficult to get the courts or even people on juries, whatever, to understand this. How does the United States like law understand coercive control? And if it's not great, uh, how can we make progress on this in the future? Like, what can we do to make them understood by the courts? Right. Like, well, we've got to we've understand got, what a cult is in the first place. Right. Right. There, I mean, you don't even have to use the word cult because uh, that's in a sense that's irrelevant when you understand coercion mm -hmm. and people manipulating other people um, and abusing them. And so our our legal system right now is not much help, but there are there are several organizations who are working toward getting this idea of coercion accepted. And so there's been some progress on the state level in a few states and there's other countries that have done this you know in the uk and scotland there is like a wikipedia page i think of like anti-cult laws yeah there are some laws about coercion um unfortunately most of them still only apply to domestic situations you know and that's the problem like i've had instances where people leave a cult you know and they go to a domestic violence shelter and they don't qualify. It's like, oh, well, your husband, it wasn't your husband who did this to you. It's like, come on, you know? And so this is, this is another big battle that we have to engage in. What do you think, I guess, of bringing that up, like, um, you know, domestic violence, uh, a battered woman syndrome, like, I think this is the best way to explain kind of what happens in a cult because people understand what it is. Can right. you explain the, like the correlation between a toxic relationship and like a controlling relationship and a cult? Yeah, it's the same thing. You know, you get isolated, you get separated from the people you know, uh, you're berated a lot, you're made to be, you know, constantly apologizing, you live in fear, you're walking in eggshells. All of that is very much the same as, as a domestic violence situation. Um, and so, you know, just as people used to say, well, why doesn't she leave him? You know, they say, oh, well, why didn't you just leave the cult? Well, it's not that easy when you think your entire life depends on staying in that group and pleasing the leader. Um, so, again, there's just a lot of work that we have to do to get that to be understood. Can you explain, I guess it's always important to hear this. How did you, you were in a cult for three years, you said? Ten years. 10 years, 10 years. How did you, 
what was it like when you found out that you were in a cult? How did you sort of find out? And how, like, how did you get out of this situation? Well, it's a long story, but I, I don't think, I didn't, I didn't actually think it was a cult. After about five years in, something happened uh, in relation to my mother and the death of my mother, which basically was a very shattering experience for me and that the cult basically told me I couldn't go to my mother's funeral. And that made me think, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be fighting for this better world. And what, what kind of world is this if I'm told I can't go to my mother's funeral? So for a number of years, I was completely disaffected and I wanted to get out, but I couldn't figure out how to get out. I, I, I was terrified. Plus, I had nowhere to go. I had no one I was in touch with anymore. I had no money. I had a broken down car. Um, but eventually what happened is, um, after it was about 10 years, 10 and a half years of my membership. And there were a number of other people who were the full-time top membership who had been in that amount of time as well. We were kind of the, the original big group of people and everybody was burned out. And the leader, things that the leader was asking were just crazier and crazier. And we were, those of us in the inner circle, you know, saw who she really was, which was an alcoholic megalomaniac, you know, and so, which we kind of kept from everyone else. And, um, but eventually what happened is she left the country. And while she was out of the country visiting Bulgaria, um, we called everyone together and told them what was going on and took a vote. And we voted to expel her and to dissolve the organization. So actually, in late 1985. There was like, yeah, you never see all got uh, out. democracy yeah. in a cult. Yeah, we all got out. <laughs> it was great. And I mean, it was great, but it was also shattering. I mean, everyone had to help each other with jobs and resumes and clothes and things like that. But you you talked about not being able to, to, to the cult didn't want you to attend your mother's funeral. Um, and I see this, I mean, this is something that's happening in front of yours. It happens in a lot of cults where you have the, the families that are separated in like right. tragic ways or, you know, people, they're, they're not allowed to go to weddings. I mean, I, I just heard this about this cult that I'm researching the body is that this woman, um, she, she missed her father's funeral and she was super, super close to her father. And that's when like somebody told me, you know, that's when I knew she, she was in deep. Yeah. Um, like, what, what, can you talk about like family separation and cults? Yeah, well, family separation is important because they want, you know, they want to disconnect you from your former life. Obviously, this, you know, people who are born and raised in a cult, that's a different situation. But for anyone who joins as an adult, they want you to turn your back on your former life, turn your back on your family and your friends. And, and mostly they'll get you to believe that those people are really bad for you, right? They're holding holding you back on your path to enlightenment or whatever they're promising, right? So that kind of separation um, is very, very important because what cults are doing, what the indoctrination system is doing is basically attacking the self, right? They're taking you apart. They're, they're making you distrust yourself, not follow your instincts, not think critically. Um, you know, you basically lose your sense of self through all the machination, whatever program they're instituting, whether it's courses or, you know, serious assignments, whatever. And they want to rebuild you as a cult persona, right? And that's why in many cults, they make you take a new name, right? Or you may be dressing differently. All of that is to erase who you were before. And naturally, an important part of that is separating you from your family or your friends or anyone outside the cult and make you essentially hate those experiences or hate those people, right? And you can only trust the people you're with and certainly, mostly, only the cult leader. I wonder, I want to say, you, you, you said it a second ago that like the cult leader was an abusive alcoholic. It's, right. it's it's weird because like control like a lot of cults are sober affairs like you're not allowed to touch the stuff right um like in profundity i've talked to three people who used to be in who have were sending marijuana i was sending weed to the leader <laughs> i from what i understand like you know she gets really stoned 
and then goes out there and talks about you know aliens and space or whatever um but she still and, and the message like if she didn't sometimes she goes off on tangents where i think she she wouldn't if uh if she wasn't stoned <laughs> um, or mix mix up you know language and stuff like that like what, what can you say about like you know she, she she does this and yet she still has like control over this situ over these people's lives like how does that well, work well people rationalize you know when i was in my cult um and as you said we were a left-wing cult right and when my leader would do like outrageous things I would I would literally say to myself well we're in the tradition of Stalin so at least we haven't killed anyone yet right yeah that was how I would rationalize her behavior right right well it, it's it's still not as bad as killing a million people right and so that's what you do you rationalize because you you're you're at that point it, it what I call bounded choice like you have been so indoctrinated you're almost like a little microcosm of the cult and you know that there are things you cannot do you cannot challenge the leader you cannot challenge the belief system you cannot think about leaving because those things would be disastrous for you so your choices are actually constrained and confined by the will of the leader, the will of the group and the will of the leader, right? That's why I say your own free will is altered, right? So whatever sense of morality perhaps you came in with, you've lost that and you've taken on the immorality of the leader. So all of these things that to us on the outside seem so bizarre and so strange, so those people on the inside, that becomes normalized, right? The abuse becomes normalized. The abuse of children becomes more normalized, right? The spouting of hatred of this us versus them thinking, all of that becomes normalized by this closed world that you're living in. How how have you seen successful stories like people, family members, I guess, mostly of people People having success getting people out of cults, getting their loved ones out of cults. Well, you know, there are there have been interventions over the years, and some of them have been successful. Um, I personally don't very often recommend doing to a family to do an intervention because it's very risky. It costs yeah. an enormous very amount. Expensive, of money. Yeah, yeah, it's very expensive, and you could make, make things worse. And so my my view is better to stay in contact with the person as much as you can, like do whatever you can to stay in touch with that person, never cut them off. And constantly, if if you're able, constantly give them reminders of the good things in life before they joined, like, you know, remind, send them their favorite cookies or remind them of the times you went sailing together or whatever, send them little trinkets and postcards and things. You wanna tug at those heartstrings so that you can reawaken the person's sensibilities to, yeah, may, maybe it wasn't so bad out there. And maybe this really isn't good for me. Do I, what I do is I, I'm put, putting videos out like very frequently, like usually every day, every other day. And I know the cult is watching them. And what I do mostly is, is frame uh, what, what Linda is saying, what the leader is saying against like reality or make it or just just to show off like the absurdity of it. And I know they're watching these videos. Like it sounds like two people on the internet side have left, which is great. Um, in the because there's like the internet cult of profanity yours, and then there's the compound. But I know that they're watching these videos. Like, who is like this guy is so bad? They're saying I'm, you know, I'm Satan or whatever. Um, <laughs> but they're watching, and I like I want to keep these things out there because it's like maybe one of these days it's like oh my god maybe like this thing is not true that i've that i've been believing for so long is is it possible do you think that like these videos could sink in or something and oh i see what you're saying well you are know, the maybe members like of, are the members uh, help allowed someone to realize at... like that reality might be not exactly what they think it is so are the members allowed to look at these videos they at least in the very beginning they were i don't know if they've seen like all of them but th this happened before with a, another cult that i was like exposing where i was putting stuff on about them on the internet and then that, that was used in a, a legal case because it was like i was a third party saying this stuff connecting this guy and his business to this cult um and now you have this situation where you know they saw all these tiktok videos they got on tiktok and started making videos 
and it's just it's crazy to wonder like if these things can act if they can have an impact i guess yeah it can i mean you know what you know my my perspective is that everyone who's in a cult has doubts all along the way you probably have some doubts even the true believers i had doubts but you're not allowed to express them, right? So you put them on this metaphor that I use, you put them on this shelf in the back of your head. And finally, one more thing happens that the shelf is too heavy and it breaks. And once that happens, you don't. You may not think you're in a cult, but you've suddenly start to think, maybe this isn't right for me. Maybe, maybe this is not in my best interest. And so you might at that point start thinking about leaving. That's why the any relationships with people on the outside or any things like this that they can see, it's planting those seeds, it's planting those seeds and you never know when it's gonna break and the person finds their way out, which may be easy or maybe more difficult depending on the situation, right? If you're on a compound, it's probably a little harder to leave than if it's an internet thing and you can just turn that off and shut down those sites. Mm -hmm. So leaving is, a whole other process 